And now I'd like to welcome to the stage the Global Vice President of Corporate Development from HTC, someone who I know many of you follow on social media. I know I certainly do. It's where I get a lot of my newest insights and what's happening in the XR space, Mr. Alvin Wong Graylin. Good morning. Um, so it was actually a very uh, interesting day. They had uh, already introduced uh, Tom Furness, which was uh, the professor that, uh, Bill, uh, that Mark and I both studied under 30-something years ago at uh, the Human Interface Technology Lab. So uh, we're kind of uh, passing the baton back and forth. And, uh, you know, Mark spoke a lot more about the technical side, so I'm going to try to speak a little bit more about the, the uh, macro-level societal and, and economic side um, of uh, what's going to happen uh, he's more talk, he talked about the last you know, 10, 20 years. I'm going to probably talk about the next 10 to 20 years and what we're going to uh, face as a society. So the last time I was in um, the last time I was in Singapore was about almost a year ago for the uh, APAC conference, and uh, it was a lot of government leaders, and all they talked about was deglobalization and how de-risking and and you know uh, every country separating. It's all about you know, uh, taking away the supply chain that, that's been created over the last, you know, 100 to 200 years, right? That's a trend that's been a, a major trend globally. Where what we're going to get to now, I think the next 10 to 20 years, um, we're going to start virtualizing everything we do, and our, our lives will be digitalized. So I actually call that uh, di-globalization or dig-globalization, dig uh, and I'll explain a little bit more over the next 25 minutes what that really means. <clears throat> and I think when we get to this new phase in society, uh, a lot of the assumptions we've had uh, of how society works and how economy works uh, will change. So we're a very, very lucky generation right now because many of the sci-fi exponential technology that's been talked about for you know, the last dozens of years or hundreds of years are now actually becoming mature simultaneously. And we, as a generation, are the first ones to be able to see that happen and to see the results of that happening. Now, this technology that uh, you know, genetic engineering will give us potentially unlimited life, uh, artificial intelligence will give us unlimited intelligence, clean energy will give us unlimited energy, and then metaverse and XR technology will give us virtual worlds that are unlimited possibilities. Now, I'm going to focus on the, the right two. But uh, you know, I think these other two technologies on the left are just as important. But as with any other te any technology, anything that's powerful will have you know two sides. It's a double-edged sword, as as most uh, uh, the Western saying goes. But I actually think that the Eastern philosophy of yin yang is actually a better way to represent it because within even the darkest parts, there's a little bit of light, and within the lightest parts, there's a little bit of dark. It's, very, it's impossible for us to have a completely double-edged sword of only positive or only negative results. There will be a mix, and it's really up to us as people in the society to see how we can nudge it towards a greater, lighter side of how these technologies are used and what the outcomes of that technology is. So, um, you know, as Ori kind of debunked a few of the myths uh, around the XR industry. I'm, I'm going to maybe have a couple of repeats with him, but I think there's a few different ones out there. Uh, first of all, you know, as, as Ori said, the metaverse and XR is not dead, and there's a lot of reasons where you saw that. Uh, and a lot of some, there's still some people that say, hey, AR is more important than VR. That, that's actually not true. As we know, AR and VR are merging. They're going to be on the same devices. We're going to be able to do both from whatever device. And there's some people who think that, hey, Apple comes out, it's going to dominate everything. Um, no, they're going to be a really important player, and they're going to help stimulate this into a new wave for this industry's growth. But even their phones and their PCs are in the 10 to 20 percent of market share. So it's not going to be the dominance that a lot of people might expect. Um, people think that XR, VR still makes you sick. Uh, no, it's actually, there's a lot of benefits to health and to health care from this technology. Um, so there's some people who think that it's all about consumers. And uh, in the West, it is, but actually in the East, uh, the B2B sector is actually a bigger segment than the B2C sector. Um, <clears throat> some people think that the metaverse is a fad. The metaverse, the concept, the word, may not be around in five or 10 years, but what it represents, the underlying virtual worlds, the 3D uh, ways of interconnecting, 
uh, all the things that uh, you know, both Mark and Ari talked about, those are going to continue and will continue to be the most natural way for us to interact with computers and with each other. Uh, some people will say, you know, metaverse and, and, and uh, Web3 are the same thing. They're actually not. They're, you know, the, the, the crypto decentralization aspect could be one use case or one uh, way of using the technology where the two combined can create value. But there's not a direct dependency uh, between the two. Uh, now with the topic of AI, there's the big question of, hey, you know, is, some people say AI is already sentient, and then some people say AI can never be sentient. Uh, both of these are probably uh, not correct. So uh, I'll go into a little bit more of that in my, my discussion. Um, some people think that AI is going to take all our jobs, and some people think it's going to free us from all our work. Um, there's truth in both of those, uh, but it may not be as scary as people think. And of course, there's the recent uh, AI doomers out there say AI is going to destroy everything. It's going to kill all humanity. You know, but some people say, hey, it's going to save the world because it's going to, you know, create uh, a new new generation of of, uh, of life and a new t form of life. So I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of truth in, in what was said, but none of that was completely accurate. So hopefully, in the next 20 minutes, you're going to get a much better sense. Um, so what is the metaverse? Uh, there was a couple definitions that Mark gave. But uh, I came up with something that I think is a little bit you know, simpler uh, and um, maybe easier to remember. Because I think the, easy to, the more easy a definition remember, uh, the more it will be useful to you. And it's really the 3D version of the internet that we've all known for the last several decades, powered by AI, and mostly interfaced through XR. Although for the next probably five years, a lot of people, most people will actually interface through the existing um, devices you're already using, the 2D uh, phones, uh, laptops, and tablets, but in interfacing with the 3D world. Um, I was uh, able to spend some time with uh, Neil Stevenson, who's uh, the guy who coined this word, and I asked him, does this definition work? And he's like, yeah, this is as good as any. When I, when I wrote this book, I kind of just made shit up. So, so this, this, this actually describes well what I kind of intended. Um, so why am I not as as uh, disturbed or excited about all these new waves and hypes because I've gone through a lot of this, right? Just like, like Mark has. Um, you know, since the 80s, I, I, came, I grew up with the whole PC generation. And I actually worked for Intel designing PC chips. I, I uh, worked on the um, various web, web projects in the beginning. I worked in the first uh, mobile uh, search companies. Um, and for the last eight years, I've worked with HTC. Um, you know, on, on helping create this whole XR ecosystem. And I studied both AI and XR uh, for over 30 years. So, so I, I've seen the ups and downs, and I don't get as excited both up or down <laughs> uh, when, when these things happen. But the next generation, the next evolution is going to be really, really exciting for all of us. Um, as we can see, you know, with every technology evolution, the types of content that we create changes. You know, so why did I say that the, uh, the metaverse is a 3D version of the internet. Because as you can see, with every new technology, we keep adding more dimensionality and interactivity to our media. And now that we have XR, uh, it's very, very natural for us to add 3D and for us to add natural interface and for us to, to add more immersion into the experience. So this is just a natural progression of how technology changes the way we interact with information. Um, you know, for the last 30 years, we've been taught to use very unnatural interfaces of keyboards, mice, and, you know, touch screens. <clears throat> it's better than maybe what it used to be with, you know, using uh, uh, punch cards or, or, you know, messing with knobs. But where we're going now is using the most natural interfaces that we have, our hands, our eyes, our mouth, our bodies, in natural ways of how we interact with the physical world. We're just going to take that, all the learnings we have there, and naturally transfer to a 3D world. And over the last year, uh, we can see new generations of products coming. And um, you know, we were the first about a year and a half ago to come up with the uh, pancake device uh, thin and light products, you know, as kind of on the top left. But over the last year or so, um, most other major companies are following that suit. And we can see that all of, these com all of these products right now that are on the screen are MR devices. They have AR, VR, MR device uh, capabilities on the, on the same product. And that's going to be the, the, the norm going forward. You know, it, when we talk about screens, right, right now we're so many screens in our lives. 
And the, the natural thinking is that we're gonna keep having a lot more screens. 100 years ago, there was no screens. It's actually hard to imagine. 100 years ago, we actually didn't, nobody had screens. Everybody just lived in the, this physical world. And with this trend, you're thinking, hey, it's gonna be another five or 10 screens over the next few years. No, it's actually the opposite. What we're gonna find is that by having uh, a, a device on your head, more and more of those screens are gonna be replaced by that device on your face. And that device, at some point, will maybe even get uh, embedded as a chip in your body, or you know, kind of that's what Elon wants to do. Um, you know, but so I think at some point we're going to go back to where we were, which is having no screens, and having a, a, a you know direct uh, um, uh, implant that can allow you to to think and, and do what you want. In fact, if you think about it, every night when we go to bed and we have our dreams, that's actually the interface that we'll ultimately get to. Except you get to control what happens in those dreams. Now, let's talk a little bit about AI, because I think that's the topic that a lot of people have been really concerned about over the last year. Um, and this graph kind of helps to, to show why people are so excited, because you can see this is an, an exponential chart. Uh, what maybe you didn't notice was that the left column, or the left axis, is actually a, a exponential, a log chart, a log um, scale, which means this is an exponential chart on an exponential uh, graph. Right, which means this thing is growing like crazy. And we're getting to a point where the number of parameters are getting close to or more than the number of uh, neurons in your, in your brain. And in fact, now getting close to maybe the number of synapses in your brain in the next, few, next year or two. So at that point, you know, having the sense that maybe these things are going to be more than just dumb machines, just answering questions, I think uh, becomes possible. In fact, the, the, the level of change we just saw was the parameter count. This, this is the, the context count. So just, you know, in the past it was, you know, a few, few hundred tokens, a few thousand tokens, a few hundred thousand tokens, and then boom, a couple months ago, uh, Microsoft came up with a new model, a, a new paper talking about a billion uh, tokens. A billion tokens, uh, this, so tokens, is, uh, these, these in context is about how much you, you put into your question. So when you ask a question to say, you know, write me a paper about this, or tell me how would Ori do his uh, you know, initial speech, that's like a you know, 20 token question. Where essentially a billion tokens is about how many words a person will ever hear or speak in their entire life. Right? So that, what that allows is, is a giant context of what information you can feed into these systems to ask questions and to create inputs. Uh, in, in real time. So when those type of scales are happening, we, we, we get to start to think about uh, the question of you know, consciousness. Are, are, are these things getting to a scale where there's so, such long-term memory, such large scale, and such breadth of information that it, it actually may be able to get to consciousness? But before we get there, let's, you know, um, people overcomplicate a little bit about the consciousness question because um, <clears throat> there's actually different levels of consciousness. It's a spectrum, it's not a point. Right. A lot of people think that only the, the, the human level of consciousness is consciousness. It's actually no. There's, you can have a, a bacteria that can sense its surrounding and start moving around. That's a level of consciousness. That's sensing your environment and reacting to it. You know, there's the, the kind of the, the definition from Nagel of you know, what it feels like to be a bat. So something that has its own feeling. Sure, it maybe has a little higher level uh, of understanding. And then there's the self-understanding, you know, chimps and, uh, you know, I think some, some uh, octopus and some, some birds are able to have that, that self-understanding of, of who they are. And then there's the sapien level, which is the, the human level understanding. In the past, AI has been pretty much, uh, they're intelligent, but there is very little of that consciousness because it was a you know, procedure, right? Whatever you put in, it just happens. It, has, it doesn't care what happened around it. And now we, you know, people talk about AGI, which is human level intelligence, but not necessarily human level consciousness. The next level is actually, well, what else, what's happening recently is, is we're getting to this middle ground of these uh, foundational models or, or uh, large language models, which people say have a spark of consciousness. There's multiple studies now that are saying you know, those type of, of, of words towards these models because it does seem to have understanding. Now, where we want to get to soon is strong AI, where it has both you know, uh, consciousness and uh, intelligence that are uh, similar to human levels and can self-improve. Uh, what that will lead to, um, well, that's still going to be less consciousness, intelligence, and a sing than the, the whole of humanity, but it'll be more than a single human. Right? Um, 
longer term, what that will lead to is ASI, so artificial superintelligence, which is essentially godlike intelligence. It will be all knowing, and it'll be thousands or millions of times smarter than, than any human. Um, the most scary part is not the, the, the superhuman intelligence. It's, in fact, I think that having well-managed, aligned human uh, artificial intelligence will actually make humans smarter. The most scary part is actually in the middle part. When we have very smart, uh, less conscious, less aware, naive intelligence that are able to do amazing things and then being managed and controlled by bad humans, that's the most scary part. So we shouldn't be afraid of artificial superintelligence. We should be afraid of near uh, uh, artificial general intelligence with limited consciousness. Now, one of the things a lot of people have recently been saying is that AIs are just stochastic parrots. You know, they just mimic what they see and they just repeat it. Uh, what we find is actually that's not really the case. And people are saying this, I think, either they don't understand it or they're purposefully um, misrepresenting it. I actually think that um, there's a, maybe a better representation of what they are. The only thing that, uh, that is true in terms of, of the parroting aspect is that if you compare it to parrots, uh, it sometimes repeats words that it's trained on. Yes, that's true, right? But uh, the, the types of analogy I think it makes more sense is a ASD or uh, autism spectrum disorder child. Uh, that actually has a better sense of representing what I think AI is today, right? And in longer term, it'll be much more than this, right? So if you look at things like, uh, you know, likes routine step-by-step -step interactions, uh, uh, ASD children has that. You know, exhibits uh, very strong art, music, math skills. ASD children has that. Can create original content. ASD has that. Um, limited uh, social understanding. ASD has that aspect. Uh, takes words very literally. It's very rational, but may not understand what you're saying. Right? So it's, it's somehow you have to explain it in, in particular ways. Can't fully understand its own feelings or your feelings and have limited motor control. Pretty much all the aspects that you would describe a, a Asperger or ASD uh, spectrum child is similar to what AI is exhibiting today. So I think if we take that aspect, don't see it as something that is completely uh, just regurgitating. It actually has capabilities and it, it has some of the unique things that, that we associate with a certain type of human. And you know, this is a, it, LLMs are actually very, very young technology, just a few years old. So, so you can think, you know, in time, this, this actually gives us hope because most ASD spectrum children become uh, happy and productive parts of society. And I think that's gonna be what we see. Um, in fact, if you look at uh, the, the number of synapses counts in, in, uh, over the lifetime of a human, uh, what we find is that uh, the, the ost, uh, um, the autistic children has a lot of synapses and they don't really prune very well. So they have actually more synapses than the average healthy human, right, or the neurotypical human, um, where uh, the pruning is actually what's important. The pruning helps people to understand what, what's important. What are the things I should pay attention to? What are the things that matter? Instead of it being oh, oh, too much information, right? And that's been the problem in the past with current models that they're so big and there's so little understanding of what the connections are between the different data that it, it creates uh, random hallucinations or confabulations. So, you know, there's, uh, I'm actually, I'm gonna go a little fast because I think I'm running low on time. <clears throat> so uh, the way we should really think about them is that AI is our children. We need to guide it, we need to help it, and we need to see it as the next generation. And it has the ability to, to really bring a lot of value to society, pretty much increasing our, our understanding, uh, helping productivity to grow by orders of magnitude so that we can do a lot more with a lot less, uh, helping solve some of the big issues like climate and energy and healthcare, uh, bringing on essentially an age of abundance that has not been possible in the past. And maybe you know, at some point taking us to, to have the ability to have interstellar travel or anything else that we can imagine. Because when you have infinite intelligence, um, it really is able to solve almost everything. Now, I just talked all the good stuff about AI, but there's definitely risk, right? And, and a lot of risks are real. Uh, you know, there's the concept of AI takeover. I think that's actually less of a real risk because the, the smarter people are, the more enlightened they are, actually the, the more compassionate they are. And I think AI will have a similar trend. 
Uh, AI alignment is one of the things that people talk about. Oh, they, they may not be evil, but they're going to you know, misunderstand you and then turn everybody into paper clips. Um, I actually think if, you, if these things are smart enough to, to, to do all these other things, they're gonna be smart enough to know that this is not necessarily the, 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 the most efficient use of either the technology or of creating um, the, the, the satisfaction to, to uh, society or to, to the universe. The things that I think are real are job displacement. There's gonna be over the next decade or two, um, very, very large job, job displacement uh, impact, you know, on the order of, of uh, 50, 60 more percent of, of society. Misuse, misinformation, manipulation, these are the, probably the most dangerous parts of, of the impact of it. And um, you know, we should probably talk afterwards because I think I'm gonna run out of time. Um, but in terms of jobs, you can see just even with the OpenAI paper that came out a few months ago, uh, it's able to do almost everything and every skill set better than uh, most white collar people today. Uh, and the, the, the area where it's most exposure, where the highest threat to a job, is actually at the highest paying level, which is completely the opposite of, of automation in the past. In the past, robots replaced jobs that were low paying. Now it's the highest paying jobs that are the most in danger. So the ones that if you see which jobs are being in danger, you know, writers and lawyers and accountants and data analysts and you know, reporters and blah, blah, blah. The ones that are the safest are you know, mechanics and plumbers and masseuse and blah, blah, blah. Right? So different types of skill sets are actually the most uh, opposite of what you think. So I'm gonna start speaking a lot faster now because I think I'm running very low. Um, if you look at this, this chart here, it pretty much, uh, I think, helps us to get a sense of where the future is going. You know, over the last 150 years, essentially, the hours per work of the average person has been dropping significantly. We we're about, you know, somewhere between 40 to 60% of the, the average workload uh, of, of a human um, about 150 years ago. And, and productivity technology has helped us to get there. That, that's not the timer, by the way. Um, but if, if you go back and you say, oh, this really must mean back in the old days, during the medieval days or the caveman days, they must have been working a lot more hours, like you know, five or 6,000 hours, actually the opposite. Um, in the past, the, the hunter-gatherers and medieval laborers were working about 1,000 hours a, 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 a year, which made them a lot more efficient. <clears throat> um, so technology will actually give us that productivity, I think, to get back to the, the medieval or the, the hunter-gatherer late ages. Um, AI also has been received very differently in different, different places in the world. Uh, developing markets actually are much more open to it because they see it as a way for them to, you know, to get to more equality with the, uh, the developed markets. So to, to, to fix the risk mitigation, there, there's definitely a lot of things we can do. I think AI has risks, but there, there are ways to solve it. We need to educate the public. We need to create regulatory bodies that will solve these issues. We need to create countermeasures that will solve that, the misinformation, misuse problem. Uh, and uh, we need to definitely create some kind of a global UBI program because for the large proportion of people that are gonna be out of a job, there needs to be a way to support them. Uh, and the metaverse is actually a way to help solve some of these issues. <clears throat> and I actually do think alignment is possible. And when we do have that uh, solved, uh, the AI and metaverse together uh, are going to create some amazing things because they're going to make content creation essentially free. They're going to make interfacing uh, completely natural and allow communication between languages, between cultures be uh, become seamless. Um, and you know, the, the two technologies actually are very, very uh, reinforcing and complementary. Um, and to create an, uh, a metaverse, the, the key is we have to have an open metaverse, not the current siloed worlds that we have right now. You know, even though we, we may say, hey, there's 600 million people using the metaverse, but they're all in very siloed, small individual uh, worlds that don't talk to each other. That's not, to me, that's not the metaverse. The internet, the, the 3D internet has to be open just like the internet of today. It has to allow you to jump between any worlds, keep your identity, and be able to transact between these spaces, right? And that's not there today. Uh, at some point, we will get there, and I think that needs to be a really important goal uh, of what we're, what we're trying to do. Uh, ACC is actually trying to help with some of this. We're, we're working on something called Viverse uh, that utilizes uh, WebXR technology, allows anybody with a browser on, on any immersive or non-immersive device to go into 3D spaces, have a common identity, have common payment systems across, and then anybody can be a, a content creator inside these worlds. So, 
I'm going to uh, probably skip a couple of these slides because they're, I think, uh, yeah. So over the last you know, few hundred years we, or thousands of years, we've gone to different economic models. And each economic model has had different uh, key um, resources that were important. And going from time to livestock to labor, you know, machines, so forth. And now we're getting back to where time, again, is the only thing that is the limited resource. A lot of people say data. Actually, I, don't, I think data will be a glut again because every, there's so many sensors out there and there's so much data. Data will not be as limited and as valuable as a lot of people think. And over each of these uh, periods, different types of ec economic models have actually succeeded, you know, from uh, egalitarian to feudalism to capitalism, socialism. Uh, and then, you know, what's next? I actually think that the, the, the next one will be, you know, we'll have to answer very quickly because um, even though Churchill said democracy is the worst form of government except for all others uh, that have been tried, uh, you have Voltaire who says the best form of government is benevolent dictator tempered with a, occasional assassination. Right? So who, who's actually right here? Um, I actually think our, our friend Plato is probably the one that helps to be the tiebreaker here because he talks about the philosopher king. And I think AI has a potential to serve as our philosopher king because it will be all-knowing uh, at some point uh, and, and be very uh, rational, which I think is the main issue with today's uh, government and today's society. I'm going to skip this political model question. Uh, but I do want to actually share this slide with you because this, this is something that I, I spent a little time reading the biographies of all of the major leaders, both good and bad, over the last century. And one of the, the, the key things I found between all of these leaders is the ones that turned out to be the most respected and, 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 and valued were the ones that were the most educated, right? And the ones that became the biggest problems from Hitler to Pol Pot to Stalin, they were the least educated. But beyond just pure education, what was also important was that, uh, well, some people say, oh, but, you know, some of them, it's about military. They, maybe, maybe they all worked in the military. Actually, that's not true. It's true that all the, all the bad ones uh, that we considered bad were military, had military background. But actually, a number of the, of the best ones also had military background. Um, but one of the other things that was really interesting was that all of the, the best leaders were avid readers. They continue learning after they, they, their formal education. So what we find is that the, the, the more people know, the better leaders they become. The more they continue to learn and, and have that curiosity, that's really the key. And that should be the way that we are training our AIs today, is that having their objective function be learn as much as possible and then find your own conclusions from that. Not trying to be overly biased in, in putting our, our, our sense of morality on them. Um, so I'm going to skip this one. I think everybody knows the, the Maslow hierarchy. Um, and everybody sees that you know, this chart is a very commonly known chart. The, kind of the more wealthy a nation, the generally happier they are. But there's a lot of exceptions around the size. Right? Um, where I think we're, we're going to need to go is uh, we're not going to get to the, the utopia that talk, everybody talks about. And it's, I, think, I think it's an impossible uh, destination because it means it's always unchanging, perfect world. That's actually not possible. And the dystopia of... Uh, you know, always unchanging uh, bad world, it's actually what people think dystopia is, is actually not true. Um, it's just, it's a, because dystopias are, are always dynamic, because whenever things get too bad, people will change and, and try to form it. What's the, the opposite of utopia is actually anti-utopia, which is a static state of, of suffering, which is essentially more like hell, right? Where we want to spend our time is actually to create something called protopia, where every day is better than yesterday. It's better than last year, but not trying to get to the perfect world. And I think if we continue with that as our goal, uh, life will be a lot better. I'm going to skip this slide because it takes a little time to develop. Uh... However, the most Actually, intelligent th this inhabitants one is worth listening to for a few seconds. Won't be men Ar C. Clark. or monkeys. They'll be machines, the remote descendants of today's computers. Now, the present-day electronic brains are complete morons, but this will not be true in another generation. They will start to think, and eventually they will completely outthink their makers. Is this depressing? I don't see why it should be. We superseded the Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal men, and we presume we're an improvement. I think we should regard it as a privilege to be stepping stones to higher things.
I'm going to skip the rest of that. But this was set 60 years ago. So I, 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 you can see how prescient he was in terms of, of understanding where the, the, the world was going. So I'm going to end with um, eight macro trends that I wanted to share with you. Because I, I think um, the sign of intelligence is to, to be able to predict and understand the future. And hopefully, this information will help you better understand the future and make you know, you know, the right decisions. Um, the deglobalization trend is something that is real. And I think it's actually a negative thing for the world because it, it creates more inequality and it creates wasted resources. Um, and it creates a sense of conflict, right? We're gonna have a demographic uh, macro trend where the world in some areas are gonna get much older and the world in some areas are gonna get much younger uh, where you know, places like Africa, there's, there's so much high birth rate, whereas the more developed countries, including Singapore, uh, there's very little low both birth rate, but they're gonna get healthier. Uh, on both sides, right, because of technology and, and better healthcare. The de of both humans and machines are going to happen because machines are gonna get smarter and that intelligence will actually give us the tools to make us smarter. <clears throat> there will be job displacement and we will know that, in fact, our jobs are probably the, 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 the least safe because where most of our jobs are probably white collar jobs that are the most easy to be replaced by AI when it becomes more mature. Um, but to me, I actually think that's a liberation because it allows us to be free to spend time on art, on poetry, on uh, discovery, on research, on things that make, give us satisfaction beyond our daily grind. Right? Reading and writing an email to somebody does not help the world, but maybe creating a really amazing piece of art or poetry or, or writing might do that. Dematerialization is going to happen in terms of our value system going from acquiring and holding physical goods and money to, to a more spiritual and digital form, right? Having a giant house may not be that important in the future when you can have a virtual world that you can go in and go, in, you know, go to any time in time, anywhere in the world, and instantly. And the decapitalization, you know, money has been the driving force for the last few centuries, but you know, really for the majority of human society, there was no sense of money, right? And, and money is not something that, it's an artificial construct that we've created to in, in, uh, enable smoother trade, but in itself doesn't have value unless we give it value, right? But if we're in a, a world of abundance where we can have anything we want anytime, we don't really need money. And it should not be the driving goal of, of why we work and why we live. The destratification of both nations, humans, and AI. In the sense of right now, the, the richest nations get richer and richer. The, the, the richer you know, one or two or five percent of the world are getting higher and higher disparity with the lower 50 percent of the world. So these kind of, of, of um, uh, stratification that's been happening over the last 100 to 200 years, it's actually getting worse and worse. It's actually, right now, the, the, the Gini index is worse than it was during the, the surf and, and, uh, and king days you know, back in four, five, six hundred years ago. Um, where I now get to the last point, which is the di-globalization or digital globalization, where I actually think we will now be a reversing trend. We will physically maybe do a lot of de-globalization, but in the virtual world, we will start to more and more reunify, reunify into a virtual world, a, a common virtual system that allow us to interact with anybody in the world allow us to, to be able to share and understand cultures very quickly, allow us to, to ship and, and distribute virtual products uh, to anywhere in the world, and virtual experiences, which are actually more valuable than, than physical goods. Right? And I think that actually will help us become a more civil society longer term. So, so we are uh, hopefully heading towards this uh, positive uh, di-globalization or dig-globalization. So my, my last question to you is, you know, what are you going to do for the next few years or the next few months or the next few days to help us get to that world where something that is a positive future for your children? Because what we do as this generation in the next decade could be what will impact society for the next thousand years. And if we don't do the right things, it could become very, very dark. So thank you very much. That's all I have.